everybody. Welcome to week 111. 111. That's got a pretty cool ring to it. <laughs> um, so here, here's the deal. You know, we've been talking about, you know, aliens have taken over Washington. So they have captivated Congress. It's not like there's anything else going on. So they might as well be talking about aliens the way I look at it. And evidently aliens abducted Adam Boatsman. Actually, they didn't. Um, he, he, he called me hat in hand yesterday. He's like, oh man, I screwed up. And he, he is coaching one of our clients. And it was a, a vision day uh, that he scheduled today. I don't know how in the world he could think about that. Thursdays for 111 weeks we've been doing this. So <laughs> anyway, aliens must have abducted his brain. So we will be talking about aliens hopefully not all that much, because I don't know that there's that much to talk about. And, and at the end of the day, what's it have to do with you? And what's it have to do with business? But we are going to be talking about stuff that's on your mind. As you know the drill, hit us up with Q&A on that Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you want to chat and harass us, Papa Joe's probably on here. He's pretty good about that. Chat is where you do that. And um, and we also have a special guest, my co-host of the Anything But Typical podcast, Ben McDonald, who is also our CEO of BGW Wealth, sold his first company when he was 24, started making money and uh, placing his own money, and then found out that he had a knack for that, went into the Edward Jones track, did a turnaround, and then we were fortunate enough to hire him, and he is the majority owner and the CEO of our wealth division. There's plenty of volatility in the market. That's why we've got him on here today, just to answer your questions with all this crazy stuff that's going on in the market as well. So, Jack, um, you might want to talk and then move around a little bit because it looks like aliens are like have taken over your polo. Yeah, well, I have two personal disappointments to share with you. First is that I left my tin foil hat at home. And uh, as Gary and Ben know, um, got on a few minutes ago out of breath because I sprinted down to where I thought the tin foil was in um, our office and it's not there. So, um, you know, with thinning hair, I don't have as much natural cover for the alien waves and brain, you know, reading and all that stuff that goes on. So. Um, yeah, so that's one disappointment. The second is I was in Washington, D.C. earlier this week and uh, for annual IFA, International Franchise Association meetings, and they usually call, I do the monument run, which is I just go in the morning and I run through all the monuments and didn't get to do that this year. And I was going to post a, a background of, of, you know, an actual photo of this week of being there. So two personal disappointments that I'm sorry that I, I wasn't on my game this week for all of you. Um, yeah, as far as kind of uh, current events, current news, um, they're you know continuing through Congress, talking about um, money and allocation of money and what they're going to do with it. Uh, they are still talking about how to deal with employees, employee wages. Um, there's just a lot of things going on, but nothing necessarily really significant to report on that it's you know for certain. Um, there are certain things that are uh, going through the House of Representatives, um, but you know, there's there's thought that it's just going to die out in the Senate because there's not enough bipartisan support for those initiatives. Uh, and so there's a lot of, as we talked about, a lot of uh, hallway discussions in the Capitol building going on uh, between uh, aides and others trying to negotiate to get things moving forward. And then, you know, obviously you have other, and, and I say the word distractions, meaning that distractions from dealing with core business issues, um, certainly not meaning to diminish what's going on in uh, other countries, um, you know, that, and our own issues in the economy. So there is discussion about, you know, are we headed to a recession? And uh, more people are saying, yes, that's where we're going. Um, I'm not sure that everyone kind of understands how things work in, in, in the cycle of, of 
the dollar essentially. So you, know, you start talking about lower supply, um, increased demand, you start talking about inflation, which then causes less consumer spending, which then causes, causes the stock market to decrease because the value of those shares decrease because no one's shopping. Then you have formula shortages and stuff like that. So um, there's just, it's, um, I want to say controlled chaos because, I mean, it could be a lot worse. And, and I think that other generations have seen a lot worse than what we have now. Um, I think that we, being in the U.S., are um, somewhat uh, isolated from a lot of things. I, I have, um, I'm in, in meeting with uh, some other attorneys in other countries and hearing their stories about what's going on in their jurisdictions, like you talk about a lockdown that you get arrested for even walking your dog uh, in your own yard kind of thing. It's like the, you were in your house and you did not come out unless you had special permission to do so. And you had to seek special permission to do those kind of things in like the UAE and in other countries, um, Australia, other places. So um, very interesting. What was also very interesting was their perspective on American politics and their impressions on our former president and our current president and what we got going on. And um, I, I'm not necessarily going to share those because I, I well, okay, I'll share them. Um, <laughs> they basically said- oh, it took, that, that took no. a lot to convince yourself. <laughs> yeah, well- Yeah, I mean, there, there just, was not a lot of conviction on it. I'm not gonna share it. <laughs> well, it's like, they're not my words. Uh, you know, well, I'm paraphrasing, but basically the, the impression generally speaking was that President Trump really screwed up foreign relationships by being a bully and doing certain things and saying, you know, America first and things like that. And so damaged the reputation. Um, you know, and, and then you would think, okay, the next thing that they would say is, and President Biden is trying to rebuild those things. Their perspective of President Biden is it's, it's uh, a, a non-event. In fact, one of them said that non-event, his presidency is a non-event because it's just not having any impact in, in relation to, or the, from the perspective of relationships with other countries. Uh, and um, so, you know, not really doing anything proactive necessarily and in some cases, they're saying, you know, pretty much um, somewhat of a, a, a one person used the term wimp, but it was with an Italian accent. So it was kind of funny the way, you know, I was like, what did you do you mean wimp uh, as in like, you know, not being strong. And uh, so, yes, that was the impression. So just to give you a little bit of international flavor of the perspective of others on our um, our domestic politics. Yeah, so. Um, I teed up Ben a little bit. Again, everybody that's on here, feel free to, you know, wail away with questions. Anything's fair game. And if we can't answer it, we'll be honest about it. We can't answer it. Um, but with all the market volatility and, you know, I, I talk with commercial bankers pretty much on a daily basis across the spectrum. And, you know, you, I don't hear a whole lot of bullishness going on out there. Um, and yet we see other sectors that are still going well, but even helium, like I was in the office yesterday, love balloons and somebody had a, a happy birthday balloon and they said, yeah, we were lucky. You cannot find helium now. We had to go to three places to find helium. I, I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, it's what they say. So anyway, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on here. So Ben, you know, do a little introduction. And if you would talk about some, I mean, you sold your first business at 24, you're a business owner mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You understand what's going on. We only work with business owners. So um, talk about what's happening in the marketplace, what you're hearing and some thoughts about what people might be able to do. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll do my best to be the uh, the poor man stand in for Adam today. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're looking at, at what's going on with the markets and what's going on with the different economies, there's there's two major red flags, and Jack actually kind of hit on both of them uh, in the intro. One is inflation and interest rates rising, um, and the other is potential of global economic crisis. And then there's a ton of layers underneath that. But 
the first sentiment before we dive into the weeds at all is volatility should be your friend, right? Like volatility creates uh, inaccuracies in prices and opportunities to go after. And Buffett has talked time and time again about the shift of wealth happens during down markets, right? From the impatient to the patient. And, and so we're going to talk through a bunch of different specifics of, hey, how can you, how can you handle or mitigate, mitigate risk of inflation, economic crisis, things like that? Um, and all of that's great. But keep in back of your mind, like whatever you're doing, the, the panic and selling when things are down, I mean, that's never worked out for anybody, right? That's how you're going to do that. Then you're not going to get back in until the markets are high again and all of a sudden you feel good and then you're just going to keep selling low and buying high and that's a, a quick way to, to lose all of your money all right so when we talk about inflation and interest rates let's start really simply and easy and just say gary you have one bond that pays you three percent a year well now interest rates are going up and now i want to go buy a bond and the new ones coming out are paying 4%. Well, why would I go buy your 3% bond if I could go get a new 4%, all else being equal, right? So that means if you ever go to sell yours, you're going to have to sell yours at less than what you bought it at because it's not as valuable as what it was. Well, what, we've, what we're also seeing on top of that is with interest rates is also carrying into lending, borrowing money, people going to buy houses, where they're spending money, right? Jack talked about people not spending money as much and also where they're spending money. So one piece on, on that is, uh, and we saw it yesterday with Target and Walmart, their earnings came out, both were, uh, were hit really hard and both stocks dropped dramatically. Well, what's happening is consumers are being more conscious of where they're spending money and they're shifting their spending from goods to services. So instead of going and buying a flat screen TV, they're going out to eat at restaurants and they're, they're having experiences and they're traveling again. So spending is happening, but they're being much more conscious about it and where they're spending is shifting uh, pretty dramatically. Then on the part of, of the borrowing piece, right? So I mentioned mortgages, but let's talk about companies for a second. After the great recession, interest rates were extremely low, right? Companies wanting to borrow money, they could get it basically for free. So what we saw was all of these companies, public companies especially, levered up pretty dramatically to take advantage of low interest rates. Well, what we're seeing now as interest rates are rising is as these companies are refinancing, now they're having to, instead of pay one or 2% interest, now they're paying four, five, 6% interest. And so one thing that you need to be talking to your wealth advisor about is when you're investing in stocks in general, are you factoring in what that, how much of their revenue is going to pay interest rates on their loans versus how much of the revenue actually gets to go back to you as a shareholder? And that, that's a big piece I want to mention early because I think a lot of, a lot of advisors and a lot of investors don't think about that. And yet those are the companies, the ones that are really levered up, the ones that are paying a lot of interest where the revenue is now just going to pay the higher interest rates. They're the ones that are most likely going to get hit the hardest uh, as we see turmoil and volatility. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, got a question that's come in yep. from Robert Mayetta, survival CFO. Good to see you here, Robert. Ben, we've uh, we've had a Fed fighting significant inflation for the first time in over 40 years, and they're behind the curve. This pullback feels like 1973 to 1975, or perhaps 1979 to 1988, 81. That's before Ben was born. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I was there. I at least, remember. The at least I didn't time. experience. I didn't experience that personally. But but go yeah. sorry, go on. <laughs> I remember it. Stagflation under the Carter administration. Not fun. Uh, those were slow, painful pullbacks, and it was not resolved into the, until the Fed got serious about pushing rates above the inflation rate in the early 80s. 
I remember that too, when mortgages were 14%. <clears throat> like the 1970s, our inflation is caused by supply issues and too much money in the system. So this period will not likely uh, be like any other recession in the past 40 years. So, so few business owners know how to prepare for that. What suggestions do you have for the small business owner on how to be ready for this recession event that's likely coming? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great uh, question. So there, there's a few pieces. First, um, oh, you got rid of the question. Oh, I yeah. just wanted to pull it up. So I had it up I'll, in front of me. I'll, I'll bring it back up. No, I, it back up. It's, it's unanswered. You're good. I got it. Okay, gotcha. Right, um, sorry. No, I've got it on the other screen. That's fine. Um, so a few things. First, whether a recession is going to actually happen or not uh, is still in question, right? More people are saying yes. But what we're seeing is we're not seeing recession, meaning that we're having GDP go down, right? We're seeing slowing growth. And so that doesn't mean recession. It means less revenue. It means less overall spending, things like that. But it doesn't mean we're going backwards. Um, the Atlanta Fed is by far not accurate from like nailing the percentages, uh, but they pretty much get the sentiment right a lot of times of, of where things are going. And I think they have the, the forward looking GDP growth at like 2.6 or 2.8%, somewhere around that, about two and a half or so. Um, and so there's still a lot out there saying that we may not go into recession territory, but we're already seeing significant decline in the, in the growth rate of our GDP. So I want to throw that out there first, right? There's no guarantee that we're going into a recession. Um, but even still slowing growth or going into a recession, how do you as a small business owner prepare for it? And so there's a few different pieces. And I think a lot of uh, the people on this got a small taste of it during 2020. The difference is we had money poured in, right? And that kind of propped us up and kept us afloat in 2020. So we didn't as a whole get hit as hard as, as what I think we, we really could have. Uh, in 2020. So there's a good chance that that happens now. And so a few different things from a company standpoint, it's more important than ever to make sure that where you're, you're getting any lending or what your leverage looks like, that that is really buttoned up, right? If people are ignoring that, they're just kind of going along with what they, what they already have. And they're not looking at any potential changes they're going to have to make in the future. That's going to be a big issue. So a lot of conversations I had with clients over the last couple of years was, hey, we know inflation is coming. We know interest rates are going to rise. Now may be the time to look at refinancing your mortgage, right? And so that's the personal level. The business level, you can take the same type of concept of what are you doing from a, a leverage or lending standpoint. The next piece after that is uh, your cash flow. And what you're making sure you have a head, head, healthy cash flow, because we're doing that from an investment standpoint, we are, there's a lot of things we're looking at, but one of the biggest is we're looking for companies with healthy, consistent cash flows, where it's not going into the point where all of their, all the free cash flow is just going to pay uh, interest rates and a little bit of dividends left over, right? And then there's nothing, there's no wiggle room for any sort of recession. Right, because anything after that, if you see revenue slow down, you're making hard decisions then at that point, right? You're laying people off or you're cutting salaries or you're not getting your own salary or, or worst case, right? You're defaulting or going bankrupt. Um, so that second piece I would look at is, is you have to really make sure that your, your cash flow is in a healthy spot. Um, so that would be the second piece that I'd, I'd look at. Um, and then the third piece to look at is what is your buffer? And that's going to come from a few different spots. It's going to come from revenue. It's going to come from expenses. It's going to come from your diversification of different revenue streams. Uh, so you've got to look at what your buffer is and, and how are you going to survive some sort of, of slowdown or recession period. And it shouldn't be something of, hey, can I weather a storm for a couple of months? You should be prepared to weather some sort of, of slowdown for a multi-year period. Because if we do go into a recession, you don't know how long it's going to last. And so don't, don't cut yourself short by feeling good and ignoring everything else because you've got two months of payroll in the bank, right? So you've got to, you have to really look at 
where your revenue is, what those revenue streams are in that diversification, what your expenses look like. And then all of that, like I said, is coming after free cash flow. So those would be the three places that I would start. You're, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> amateur. Next, you've done this 111 times, plus all the podcasts. I, I, Pretty plus amateur all the podcasts, mistake, right? I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I turned my mic off. Um, so the next question came in from somebody that's anonymous. It says, is that real GDP or gross GDP growth that you were quoting? Yeah, good question. Let me, higher? Give me one second, because I think I have it up from what I was reading earlier. Um, <clears throat> real so GDP estimates. Questions. So real GDP estimates of the Atlanta Fed um, is 2.4% is is what it the future uh real-time gdp estimator is for them that's for q2 is real gdp 2.4 percent and that's so from the, the atlanta that's question. not that's not me saying something right that's yeah <laughs> sorry what were you yeah, saying the, the the things that uh we learned in the securities world not to say are guaranteed returns <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, you don't want me <laughs> estimating <laughs> estimating real GDP. Like let let the people where this is all they do, let, let them do that. And I'll just quote them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the follow-on question on that one was if inflation yeah. is higher than gross GDP, isn't that still the workings of a pending recession? Um is inflation higher than gross GDP? Is that still working? Um, yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good point too. So when that happens, yes, it's more likely that it could lead to a recession. Um, but it's an indicator and there's lots of different indicators that we want to look for, for a pending recession. That's one of them, but there are lots of others as well. All right. Next question from Robert. Should we really believe the feds forecast yeah. given how wrong they've been? Yeah, I think they if missed from the 80. government. They're here to help. <laughs> I think they missed by by eighty basis points or 08 percent in in the first quarter, and and so yeah, when we're looking at that type of stuff, look less at the specific number and look more at the trend. Do they think it's going to go negative? Do they think it's going to increase from where it was? Do they think it's going to slow down or decrease? They've done a really good job of that of getting the trends correct. But hitting the actual numbers, they are actually pretty bad about it. Um, their standard deviation, I don't remember what it is, but it's its not great. So think less about that when, when you hear me say that type of stuff of, or even if you're reading an article of, hey, what's the number gonna be? Don't get caught up with that. Look more at what's the trend. Is our GDP growing? Is our GDP slowing? Are we starting to go negative? That type of stuff. So I'm going to th throw a little bit of a left turn here on this okay. notion of trends, and I'm going to kick it over to you, Jack. And that is, you know, and I've got some clients like this, but I'm really curious about your clients and if there are trends that you're seeing because you are an, a mergers and acquisitions expert, an attorney, what are you seeing from clients that are either thinking of an acquisition or uh, whether it be on the buy or sell side and what's happening with all this volatility are you seeing it scuttle deals are you seeing it accelerate deals i'm just curious yeah so kind of a little bit of an unexpected phenomenon so you know, because we're still in covid because there's variants because of things that are going on with the economy um so you would think that, okay, maybe activity would slow down some or significantly slow down. And, and what I had not really considered was that because of COVID, businesses were already doing things that they should be, they were forced to do things that if, you know, if it, is it, if it were same as it was before, that they wouldn't be doing, meaning if business was moving along and they didn't have this disruption of COVID into the business, you know, in all the aspects of it, supply chain, employment issues, money issues, you know, shutting down those kind of things. So businesses were already in the mindset of trying to become more lean, trying to find where the weaknesses 
were in the business model moving forward. And I think that that has put many businesses that took the time to do those kind of things that were forced to do those kind of things in a much better position today, um, given the economic environment than they were, would have, I think, otherwise been in um, coming into or continuing into this, you know, recession, essentially. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, but for those things that are, you know, I shouldn't say but for, but I mean, it's a significant factor in causing the issues that may be leading us to a recession. So it's kind of like chicken and egg, cart, horse, all those things. But it is, I, I think that and it, we are just, it, I, I am surprised on a daily basis and kind of, you know, being the, essentially the service line leader, department administrator for my corporate group is in seeing the, the files that are coming in and the, the transaction values that are coming in, I'm like, okay, you know, uh, it's either people have their heads in the sand, not realizing what's going around, around or they really, truly are in positions to be able to do something, either buy or sell. Um, and the continuing, what is expected is the continuing uh, transition planning, succession planning, exit planning that is going on, more succession planning um, that, okay. Um, and you know, for me personally, is it, is it a, a sense of, okay, your better realization of your own mortality, regardless of what age you're at? Is it that, okay, you know, I've worked hard and I want to enjoy it and not expect that I'm going to be able to enjoy it down the road because no one knows if they have a down the road kind of thing. So there's that. Uh, I also think that there were business owners that are already in that mode, moving in that direction that were abruptly stopped. And now we're seeing the catch up of that type of activity of transitions to, um, you know, the, the next generation uh, to uh, third party sales, um, seeing uh, international transactions. So seeing businesses coming into the U.S. and vice versa, um, you know, imports and exports and just, uh, um, you know, dabbling into the, um, the uh, U.S. economy now that may slow down or it may increase. I mean, I think it depends what kind of business you're in, it depends on currency exchanges and in which country you're doing business with. Um, I think that the, isn't the Euro close to the dollar now or, or almost near to it? I think, I mean, I, maybe I misheard that this morning or yesterday morning, but I mean, you know, the ratio was, was significantly different uh, well, only a couple of years ago, maybe a couple of months ago, but I think it's getting closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. It's, so one euro is, is $1 and six cents. Okay. Yeah. So very close when it was like maybe a buck 30 or, or, or 1.3 to one, uh, something along those lines, which is not significant in smaller amounts, but in, in large amounts. So, you know, trading power, economic power uh, on the international lines. So, but to, to get back to your specific question, I think that businesses are better prepared because of having to be reactive to uh, things that were brought about by COVID and the, the, the wake of things that occurred after, or, you know, once COVID uh, impact started uh, affecting businesses and, per and people. Well, you touched on, you, you did a nice lead into Bruce's question, which this is a jump yeah, I don't know. for both of you guys. Yeah, Jack, I don't know if you saw the question ahead of time, but yeah, I, I was looking at the question and you, you started hitting on that topic. <laughs> so I'll read the question. It says, what are the threats to the dollar standing in the world? Do we have enough data as to the impact during this strengthening period on our import and export performance? Is there an actual or only an expected trend? Um, yeah, so a couple of things. First off, it's probably the... Uh, Import export is probably the, the easiest, so I'll, I'll hit on that first. Um, right now, what it's doing is it's making imports cheaper and exports more expensive. Right, so that's a easy way to say, of, hey, what's that? What's going on with that? Um, as far as the U.S. dollar, so from a standpoint of reserve currency, there's really no alternative for global trade right now. The SWIFT system, which is the system that allows for wire transactions, that's still dominant. Um, so what you're seeing is what Jack hit on of the, um, the crunching of 
the spreads between things like the US dollar and the euro, things like that, right? So I had looked it up real quick as he was talking. A year ago at this time, that spread was one euro was a dollar 22 on the US dollar, right? So you're seeing that crunch and getting close to that one to one. But as far as reserve currency, there's no, there's no real alternative uh, on the global scale right now. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that point, Jack. No, I mean, that, that it's accurate. And it's, you know, you, you can focus on economic policy, but, you, you know, you need to also include politics and things that are going on that have an impact. And an example of that is um, oil and gas. Okay. You know, it's easy to point to COVID. It's easy to point to supply chain, but, you know, it's that because of sanctions against Russia or non-sanctions against Russia, uh, depending on where you're at uh, in, in the world, you know, those things have an impact on us um, and is part of the reason why you're seeing these ridiculous gas prices. Um, and hopefully uh, uh, you're not driving a V8 um, like I am out of necessity for family, family uh, um, Ubering, but uh, you know, it's, and, and then, so what's the next effect of that? Are we back to, you know, alternative fuel? Are we back to electric vehicles and components, which then goes back to how do you produce the electricity if you're not using fossil fuel? So, you know, it's just, there's yeah. lots of things we can talk <clears throat> about and the pluses and minuses, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, economic analysis, but then you really have to put in the political analysis. And I, I, I'm an expert in none of that. Um, I'm a, an observer like most of us are. And, you know, seeing this and, and learning more about how the impact of these things work, uh, when you start tugging on one thing, what is the ripple effect through everything else? So speaking of ripple effect, I'm going to go there, and the question is this for either one of you, but especially you, Ben. Crypto collapse. Talk about that. I mean, billions of dollars vaporized, and you know, I know people that were early Bitcoin investors. They sold. You know, others that have poured ridiculous amounts of money into that and then are probably wondering why in the world they did that right now. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about crypto and, and the crypto collapse? Yeah. So, and Gary, you and I were talking about this just casual conversation the other day. Um, there's, there's a lot to this. And so I'll, I'll try and use um, some analogies that are more traditional trading type stuff. When you think of the lower quality, nothing backing them, no technology backing them type stuff, the Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, thing, things like that, that people have been able to put on social media that they've made so much money on, think of that more like day trading, right? It has significantly less to do with how good or bad is it? What price is it? You're just trying to jump on, on trends and make a quick, uh, some quick money there's a very good chance that a lot of those go the way that we just saw uh, the other day with that stable coin um, where it goes to zero. On the flip side, there, there is real technology behind a lot in the, in the blockchain system and behind a lot of these tokens. So Gary, the, anal or the example I gave you um, the other day was Ethereum. So behind Ethereum, and most people just know of Ethereum as a coin that they can invest in, but the technology behind it very likely could lead to a platform that people are writing legal contracts on. Where like when you go to buy a house, that your contract could be on the Ethereum blockchain. That's one big piece that it's capable of doing. So that has real applicability to people's lives, people's businesses, compared to something like a Shiba Inu that somebody made to drive a trend and try and make a quick dollar. So blockchain itself and the technology behind it, there's a very good chance that we see 
winners that do really well because they have that applicability. They have the right technology behind it. I'm pretty sure it's Ripple. That's a coin that interacts with our current banking system, whereas most of these are completely independent and don't interact with our current system. Okay, well, if we don't want to have a major upheaval of our entire system, there's a good chance that some coin like that ends up winning because now we don't need to change everything. We can have a coin that interacts with the current system. So you're going to see uh, tokens and blockchain technologies that do last that yeah they're going to be affected by the roller coaster of volatility because it it's so new most people don't even understand the the fact that like what i just said of, of ethereum most people don't know that there's applicability behind it most people see these nfts these like jpeg pictures that you made on your windows 95 and are wondering why it's going for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, a lot of that is trends, but there's also things out there that companies are doing, like Nike's done a lot of this, where if, if you own some of these NFTs, every once in a while, you're getting drop shipped stuff. You're getting sneakers, you're getting gear, you're getting invited to a private event. Um, some artists are selling, musicians are selling tickets and the way you're getting in is you have an NFT and behind that NFT is a code and that code is a ticket to get into that event, right? So once you get past the hype of all of this stuff, look for the applicability, find the things that are going to have a reason to be around, not just because you saw it on your, on your Reddit page that you should go buy this coin, right? Like, that that's what you're going to see in crypto is a ton of volatility because it's still so new and there's so much unknown. A lot of people are doing it on their own because very few we're fortunate we're at BGW we're set up to where we can manage crypto for clients. Vast majority are not right. So that leaves the individuals to have to go do it themselves and they don't know what they're doing. They're just being told that they need to go invest in crypto. So they're going and investing in crypto, right? Well, that's not, <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster because you don't know what you're actually investing in. And I'm using you as a general, right? There are lots of people that go out there and do the research and figure out what they should be investing in. But that's what you're going to see in crypto. You're going to see a ton of volatility. You're going to see a lot of losers of tokens, I mean, um, and people trying to make a quick dollar in just like people try and make a quick buck in day trading, right? And we saw that with... Um, uh, shoot, what's it called? AMC and uh, GameStop and things like that. A lot of people made money. A lot of people got in late and lost everything. I mean, people committed suicide over it because they took margin and thought that they owed hundreds of thousands of dollars to like E-Trade or Schwab or things like that. So you're going to have a lot of each side of that, but you'll you'll absolutely have long-term winners because the technology is very real and, and we'll use it in the future. Yeah, it's funny having lived through the dot-com bust and running a dot-com at that time that was, is still around bizjournals.com. Yeah. But we were in the middle of all that craziness where, you know, this one company that we invested in, it was a, it was a competitor. <clears throat> we put a million bucks into their company and they sold for 225 million bucks on a $40 million a year loss. Yeah. They didn't even have a million top line sales. Yep. Believe it or not, NBCI bought them. And I remember thinking, and I came back to Ray Shaw, who was my chairman. And I said, Ray, I feel like the world's upside down. You know, like the more money you lose, the, the more the valuation is. I just, and I, you know, sock puppet, you know, <laughs> pets.com yeah. were on Super Bowl ads and they're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars. And we were running like, very frugally, like just the opposite. And he said, Gary, this thing is unsustainable. It's not, yeah. it's built on, you know, fakery. And he called it to the month when the collapse was going to be. I mean, he was amazing. And, and I see some of those same sort of trends, if you will, or it reminds me, you know, you need to be in crypto. Well, 
back then, if you had anything dot com, it was yeah. worth a bazillion dollars when anything that had tangible value was discounted like, nah, you know, that's old school. So in the light of that, I'm just curious, Ben, there's so much hype, there's so much, you know, media proliferates information and dis disinformation very quickly. And it's hard to tell the difference between the two many times. Um, what are you, what would you recommend to somebody that is nervous about all this stuff and what's going on? Um, you know, what are some things that they can do to protect themselves? And what are the kind of conversations they should be having with their advisor? For crypto specific? No, in general. Okay. Beyond, yeah, yeah, yeah. beyond crypto. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think your comparison to the dot com is, is, is pretty accurate, right? How much is hype versus how much is reality? Um, whereas there were companies that came out of dot com that are still around and dominating the world, right? Um, so, yeah, the questions of what, what should you be talking about with your advisor? Um, there's a few different pieces. So I mentioned one earlier, right, of the companies, how much of their revenue is going towards paying interest on loans and, and things like that. What does their free cash flow look like? Um, so that's one. Uh, another one that very few people know about is roughly 40% of revenue from the, the companies in the S&P 500 comes from international uh, locations, which means if you own just the S&P 500, you're getting United States companies, but you're getting a lot of international exposure. And one of the biggest flaws that I see advisors do is they'll say, oh, I need to have large United States companies, small United States companies, large international companies, small international companies, emerging market companies. And you end up having like more than 50% exposure outside of the United States because you're double dipping internationally. And very few people take that into account of where's the, where's the business coming from, not where is the company located. And you've got to factor both of those things in. So that would be another thing. A lot of advisor or a lot of clients that we've transferred in recently uh, have had way too much, in our opinion, of where we like the markets. Uh, they're overweighted internationally compared to where we would like them to be. But if you just looked, hey, US versus international, it doesn't look that much of a disparity. So take into account if you're going after and investing in really large United States companies, you're getting a lot of international exposure already. So how are you mitigating that risk? And, and how are you handling that? Are you factoring those things into account? Because a, a betting man would, would bet on that's not being taken into, into account. Um, so that's another uh, thing. The next one is going to be, what are you doing and what are you investing in as far as size of companies? So I mentioned borrowing uh, earlier, right? And leverage, things like that. So one of the things that Keith, our portfolio manager, um, is really keeping close eye on are the high yield spreads, meaning, and it's called the OAS spreads, if anybody ever wants to, to look it up at all. But it's the spread for the yields above the benchmark rate. So for example, right now, the 10-year treasury is at 2.8%. The spread, that OAS spread, is 4.6%. So if you're a small company, you're going to go borrow money and say on a 10-year. You're going to go borrow money at the 2.8 plus the 4.6 on top of it because you're not... In, I'll say smaller to mid-sized companies, but like you don't have the prominence of a company like Apple where you can go negotiate your own rates. So these small and mid-sized companies are paying 7.4%, right? If we do the 2.8 plus 4.6, they're paying almost 7.5% to borrow, which means small and mid-sized companies as interest rates rise are gonna be dramatically more affected where they're much higher risk of defaulting, which they were already higher risk of defaulting because they're smaller companies. And now you tack this extra four and a half percent spread on, on it. Um, so that's a big piece too, that what we're doing internally from a portfolio management standpoint is we're going much higher quality and much larger companies, um, again, in general. 
Uh, so that's another piece to look at is what are you investing in as far as size of companies? And then the last one that I'll have, there's more, but I don't need to throw a million things at everybody. So the fourth thing is how are you handling inflation and interest rates risk from a non-stock perspective? I've talked a lot about stocks, but in the past, bonds were the safe haven, right? You, you could go get a bond, you're going to collect your dividend, may, make, may grow a little bit, it's not going to move that much from a stock standpoint. Well, as inflation ramps up and as interest rates rise more and more, traditional bonds are being negatively affected. And so some of the stuff we're doing internally is we're including things like inflation protection securities. We're including uh, commodities. We're, we're looking for things to mitigate inflation risk because we don't think it's done. We think it'll continue. It'll be a multi-year thing that we're gonna see from that. So how are you mitigate, mitigating inflation risk is a big piece. Um, the only part on the stock portion for, in, or the only other piece for the stock portion on inflation is we're doing a lot of looking at companies that are rising dividend companies where they increase their dividend every year. That helps combat inflation, right? If we have a company that pays a dividend, but every year they've increased it 5% and our inflation's at eight and a half, well, it's almost making up for what we're seeing in inflation from at least a dividend or income standpoint. And so that helps, helps it to where they're not hit nearly as hard compared to a growth type company where it's not paying any dividends. As inflation happens and as we have uncertainty about our future, well, most of the growth company's value is based on future projections, right? It's not based on where they are today. So if we have uncertainty in, uh, in our economy and a potential recession looming, and then we have inflation, now they're getting hit twice. So that's, that's just another piece for us to be looking at is what type of company are you looking at? It's not just large or small. It's not just US or international. It's also um, those types of things that you should be factoring in and your wealth advisor should be, should be putting into your portfolios. Next question for Bruce, given the justifiable focus on Europe today, given NATO and the Ukraine and our administration's justification of a pivot towards activism in Asia, it appears that Africa and South America may see limited public or private investment coming out of the US. Is investment in these continents during a potential food crisis likely to be minimized if not abandoned? And will China continue to seize this opportunity to gain soft, soft and hard assets from these continents? Um, yeah, so you bring up a piece, I mean, hitting on, on China also, that is extremely relevant. Uh, I don't know if anybody's a Ray Dalio fan. Um, he came out with the book Principles, he, but he also came out um, with another book talking about, I can't remember the name right now, um, but it's, it's talking about the like, the world orders, right? The, the company or the countries that have dominated the world and talks a lot about US versus China right now. China is a tough place uh, for us to be figuring out how to invest in because you have this country that is growing faster and more consistently than any other country in the world. And yet, you also have the restrictions of the government where a company can basically go away or get dramatically hit or now revenue is taken from them. So it's really hard to invest in the country because of that piece of uncertainty. Take Alibaba versus Amazon. I mean, Alibaba should be significantly larger than Amazon from a market cap standpoint. Um, as far as what they do from a business, what their like their their client base, all their customer base, all that, it really should be. But the uncertainty around the governmental impact and those restrictions make it difficult. So I think the answer is yes to your question of like, is China going to take advantage of it? My my thought or my opinion would be yes, they are going to take advantage. They are going to continue to find opportunities, just like you as an individual should be finding the opportunities during uncertainty to improve your own net worth and your own uh, growth, China is going to be doing that from a country standpoint. How we take advantage of that is much more difficult for us to navigate. 
Um, and then what was the first part of that question? It's for some reason not coming up on my question. Oh, yeah, it's actually in the chat. Oh, okay. It, it didn't come in through Q and A. Nope, that's fine. I can pull that up. Um, justifiable focus on Europe today. Um, You know, somebody he while he's him. thinking about. No, sorry. Um, what were you going to say? You can go first. I was just going to say Gloria Neeland, who runs a company called Trilink Global out in um, Manhattan Beach, California. Um, she was top female Deutsche Bank exec and retired early. And she runs this big, now it's called ESG fund, but they go into a lot of these emerging markets and they, it's, it's more than microfinance. It's not Grameen Bank or anything like that. But she, she would be an interesting person, Bruce, to just um, go stalk a little bit on LinkedIn and also check out what they're doing at Trilink Global because she's got her fingers on that market probably as, as good as anybody I know. But go ahead, uh, Ben. Yeah. So Bruce, and I'll ask this first, and maybe Bruce, you can you can put in real quick in the in the chat. Um, when you say investment in these continents, are you talking about the United States investing in that? Or are you talking about us as individuals investing in that? Um, that if you can answer that piece, I may be able to um, give you more specific uh, because that's going to probably be different answers, but. As you're, you're typing that, one thing that I'll say is investing in these continents. Okay. All right. Both. All right. That's, that was probably the right answer, right? I should hit on both anyway. <laughs> um, so similar to what I was saying earlier about volatility should be your friend. Uncertainty also creates opportunities. The, the issue is navigating it, especially outside the United States. So as far as individuals investing in, in these continents, um, significantly more difficult because we don't have the information or data that we have compared to investing in companies in the United States or looking at which bonds we should be getting based off of their credit ratings, things like that. So from an individual standpoint, that's gonna be a lot more difficult. Um, we do a ton of individual investments, meaning we own the actual individual stocks or, or things like that, uh, or the individual derivatives, all those types of stuff. Um, but when we're looking at those, especially third world countries, emerging markets, we are using um, ETFs or exchange traded funds to have money managers where that is all they're doing. Um, because we wouldn't be able to, and, and individuals are gonna have a very hard time navigating those waters because there's so much uncertainty around it for a lot of the reasons that you put in the chat. Um, from a government standpoint, I, I don't know how we're going to handle it. We've been much more passive uh, than historically. Um, but at the same time, just like what I said of China is going to probably try and seize this opportunity, are we as a United States going to try and match that? Right? Are we also going to try and seize opportunities there? and take more market share of what's going on internationally. I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be the piece to see, hey, are we going to get back to being a gr more aggressive on a global scale? Or are we going to continue with, with what we've done and China be the more, the more aggressive country? That so a few kind of additional comments on both of those things, starting with the China question. Um, I had the, the privilege of listening to a very high ranking military official who was um, in charge of um, counter terrorism in a sense of um, cyber attacks uh, and intelligence gathering, essentially spying um, and uh, listening to things that he, you know, generalized, wasn't very specific, but, you know, there was a focus on China and their, I mean, he, he said, pretty much quoting, China wants to dominate the world, and they have wanted to do that through the centuries, through dynasty, 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 and that hasn't changed. Um, what has changed is the, the, the mechanism of attempting to do that. He also said that China is very patient. They don't need to dominate the world in this century. If it happens two centuries from now, then 
they will be fine with that. There's that kind of mentality. Now, again, that's him saying that I, I have no perspective to validate or, or um, uh, you know, say otherwise. So there's that aspect of it where there's, oh, and, and the evidence of that is the attempted uh, intrusions into our technology, the attempts um, and, and the way that they treat technology, which is it, anything out there, regardless of whether you have a patent or otherwise is free game. And, you know, so there's no, you know, there are intellectual property laws. They're not very well respected. Um, there's corruption and other things that go on. And um, so businesses have to decide whether or not they're going to play the game and take the risks in jurisdiction in countries like that. Um, as far as foreign investment, there's, there's different aspects of that analysis, which is uh, going, you know, for, as individuals or business owners going into a foreign jurisdiction like South America, Central America, um, and other jurisdictions that are not being focused on like Ukraine and others in, in the food crisis as, as the question was posed is that um, what is the ability financial and otherwise to invest into those foreign countries? But there's a reciprocal and symbiotic effect and impact and expectation, which is what is that country going to do for me um, as a U.S. business owner? Uh, what incentives are there? What precautions are there? What, you know, so what taxation is there going to be? So those kind of things. So it has to be a symbiotic relationship. And I'll give you a, a, an example that, um, so <clears throat> the, uh, and, and there has to be, a, a, I think, an attenuation of U.S. business arrogance that we need them more than they need us. And I'm on the other side of that where I represent um, a, um, a developer, a franchise developer in a Central American country that has been doing this for decades. And new management of the US franchisor, and this is a food service, is actually different brands that you would recognize. Um, well, I'll just tell you, it's, uh, for example, Little Caesars, Burger King, uh, Popeyes, and um, with one of those franchisors being very arrogant as to this is the way you're going to do it. Uh, we're the new owners. We're the new sheriffs in town. And this is the way you're going to do it. And my guys are like, no, you have no idea what you're doing um, in this country. You cannot implement American standards um, blindly into this country and, and expect certain things. It is the relationship driven. And so... Uh, it gives my client a tactical advantage that that franchisor can't cut them off and say, we're going to give the, the development rights for the country to someone else. But so there, there's those factors as well. So I go back to the, you know, there's an economic analysis, there's a political analysis that factors into all of that. So that's why it's not an easy answer to give when you start asking about, okay, what is the impact? But I think that it, it, there's some introspective thought process that needs to happen as to whether or not you are able to invest that we as us business owners able to invest are we retracting and kind of sheltering um to get through what's coming next essentially so um you know I, and and i think that you know we are spending there is a pivot uh in, in government spending so i was talking about basically private businesses but governments as well is okay um and then what incentives are available to bring foreign investment into the us you know we, we spent a lot of money um, on SBA programs for businesses and other things. And, and you know, look at, at uh, the, the current White House potential budgets moving forward. It's, it's a lot of money that's being spent um, not on necessarily foreign investment. It's, it's for, you know, stuff at home. Um, yeah, there is. But, and I say that, and then think about all the money that's going out the door to uh, help Ukraine um, as well. So it's just... Um, anybody who has attempted to do a, a pro formas or budget and, you know, where you have to kind of pick and choose. And I think I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and in Leadership Charlotte here, they put you through a budget simulation for the, you know, um, uh, produce the budget for Mecklenburg County for next year. And you're like, okay, how hard can that be? And you look at what was there before and you're like, well, I think th this money should go here. And then you have the county officials telling you, okay, if you do that, this is what happens, you know, and, and just total unbeknownst to us consequences is very um, revealing and enlightening. So uh, 
goes on at the federal level, state level, et cetera. So um, long-winded answer to the question of what is the impact uh, in foreign jurisdictions? Well, you guys have done a great job. We're coming up at the top of the hour, noon. Uh, I heard somebody's uh, stomach rumbling or it was an uh, alien UFO that was going over. I don't know what it was, but I heard something. <laughs> well, I'm sure that Congress will find out about it in a little bit too. Um, anybody came on late, we will put this up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel. Ben, thank you for joining us. We'll have to have you back again, especially given some of the crazy stuff that we're seeing. Uh, Jack, as always, thank you very much. Stay tuned for next week. We'll see what next week brings, but we're getting ready for... Memorial Day weekend in another week. So uh, we plan on being back here. So in the meantime, if you need anything, you know where to reach us. We'll look forward to having you back here on same time, same bat channel. And hopefully the aliens will release Adam and he'll be back next week. <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, yeah, Ben, thank for jumping you. in. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, you did a good job, Ben. Thank you. See you.